Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 11th of September and a pretty small set of updates this week, so we should be able to get through them super quick. As always, I do have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New video this week, I created a video all about the Custo query language. We use this to interact with things like Azure Data Explorer, but also Log Analytics Workspaces, the Azure Resource Graph. So I think about, hey, I have some metrics, some logs, and I want some great insight into them. We use KQL to do that. So I really go through the structure of KQL and then ways I can use information from different tables. On to what's new. So Azure Spot Pricing and Eviction is now available via the Azure Resource Graph. So remember, if you think about Azure, we always think about this infinite amount of scale. And the way it does that is obviously it has to always have a certain amount of spare capacity. Well, just sitting there doing nothing is not ideal. So Microsoft make it available with spot pricing. We as the customer pay less money and we can set a maximum amount we pay, but we get that reduced cost on the understanding that if a regular pay-as-you-go workload wants it, we can get evicted. So I would use this if I had maybe a batch job, something that wasn't time critical, but was resumable. And as I've shown about in past updates through the portal, I can now go and see, well, past eviction rates. I can see pricing compared to different regions so I could find where it's even cheaper. But now through that Azure resource graph, remember the resource graph is fantastic because it's very, very scalable, very highly performant to query about our Azure resources across our entire tenant. It's not using the regular Azure Resource Manager REST API that really doesn't scale well if I'm trying to get information about a huge number of resources. So as we can see here, I've already got this up and running and ready. Hey, I can just run a query now. So I'm looking at the spot resources table and here I'm looking about various locations and I want to know what is the eviction rate. And this is Custo query language, by the way, which is what I just did the video on. But down the bottom, I can see, okay, based on the SKU I selected for the different regions, I can see the different eviction rates. I could also, for example, and I pre-create the query over here, I could get an idea about pricing. So maybe I wanna see, well, what's the latest spot price for a few different regions? So I could say, hey, I'll go and pick the cheapest one so I can really run this batch job I have running for as cheap as possible. So this is great. Now, programmatically, I could go and hook into the resource graph, find out where the maybe least eviction rate or where the cheapest is, and then dynamically schedule my workload to just really optimize my cost. On the storage side, resource instant rules for Azure storage have now gone GA. If I think about regular storage accounts and many other types of resource as well, but I have a virtual network and there are a number of different mechanisms I could use to lock down access to the storage account. One of them is at a subnet level, I can enable something called a service endpoint. That then makes this particular subnet a known entity. So then on the firewall of my storage account, I could say, hey, yes, um, subnet one, I want you to allow that through. Great. We can also create things like private endpoints. So a private endpoint points to a specific instance of a resource, like a specific storage account, and then anything in that virtual network or connected to it could go via this private endpoint. So it's a way of controlling via the network access to the storage account. But what about if I have an Azure resource that cannot exist inside that virtual network? So I cannot control it using, hey, it can't live in that subnet so it could use the service endpoint. It can't connect to this VNet so it can't use the private endpoint. So the whole point of resource instance rules are that essentially on this firewall, I can say, hey, this resource, maybe it's a logic app, maybe it's some kind of Synapse service, um, Synapse analytics. I can say, hey, this resource, it's allowed. 
So even though it doesn't exist in this virtual network, for a resource instance rule, I can let it in. Now, it has to have a managed identity, and that managed identity would then still need data plane access. This is controlling, can I talk to it? It doesn't then give it permission to interact with the data plane. So then the managed identity of, for example, this logic app would have to get some maybe a blob data reader role or whatever I need there to actually make that function. So if we jumped over super, super quickly, if I was to go and look at my storage account and I'll just pick any of them, it doesn't really matter at this point. We can go and look at our networking and what we're gonna do is that same enabled from selected virtual networks and IP addresses. And then you see I have this concept of resource instances. So within here, I can now say, well, what type of resource is it? These again are commonly things that can't directly interact with the virtual network. So it can't use a service endpoint. I can't use a private endpoint. And then I could say, hey, everything in the tenant everything in the subscription, or I could pick specific ones. So this really now lets me tune down and control who can interact with my storage accounts. So those resource instance rules, they have now gone GA, so we can all go and use those. So really nice new capability to help protect and really lock down access, which is what we want. If we always think zero trust and we think defense in depth, the more layers of protection I can add, the better, never assume anything. On the database side, so Azure Data Explorer now has a Kusto emulator. So this, so remember Azure Data Explorer is a phenomenal service where I can send my logs, my telemetry, my metrics from all different types of source, store it, but then it gives me that great analytical capability to get the insights, which is what I really care about from all of the data we send to it. Again, Log Analytics sits on top of Azure Data Explorer, Azure Sentinel sits on top of Log Analytics Workspace. So these all leverage this service. And that KQL is the language to get those insights. So now a Docker Windows container is available for free that provides me this Kusto emulator. So it gives me local development. I don't need any internet connection. I could test my development completely offline. It's gonna expose a HTTP query endpoint. So I can use Kusto Explorer, the Kusto CLI, the Kusto SDKs, all those familiar tools, but I don't need any Azure service spun up to do that. Now, it's not giving me a data management service. There's no concept of data ingestion through queues or managed or streaming ingestion, but I can use the regular ingestion commands. I could take data from a local file, for example, and ingest via the ingestion commands. I could take it from various external sources, like a table to populate it, so I can do this testing. Um, remember, there are other options for free as well. I can get a free ADX cluster, and that lets me then have some of those managed ingestion options. The scale is different, so look at both of them, see which works better for you. Miscellaneous, a whole set of updates about Azure Stream Analytics. Remember, Azure Stream Analytics is a fully managed stream processing engine. We think about this huge volumes of streaming data that I need to process, maybe even alert on, with very, very low latency. So these streams could come from devices, sensors, applications, feeds, and typically that ingestion will go via an event hub or Azure IoT hub. So Stream Analytics can now authenticate to service bus actually using managed identity. So I don't have to worry about storing credentials or anything else. So service bus queues and topics, I can just use a managed identity. It is a system assigned managed identity that is job specific. So each job I create in Stream Analytics will have its own system assigned managed identity. And it's that that will then be given permission to the particular service bus. I might be given the Azure service bus uh, data sender role, for example, but gets rid of having to worry about storing credentials, which is always an unpleasant thing. Stream Analytics has a no code editor update. So one of the nice things about Stream Analytics is I don't have to necessarily write code to think about that flow through Stream Analytics. When I think about that whole idea of the stream inputs, the transformations I might need to do, and then the outputs. 
So I can reference data from, for example, a SQL database or ADLS Gen 2 as part of the enrichment. So other data that I add as part of my logic to that incoming stream. I can filter, I can ingest, I can transform, and I can send it to a data lake, i.e. ADLS Gen 2. I can send it to a dedicated SQL pool, which now includes private endpoint support. I can send it to a SQL database. I can set, store it in Cosmos DB. All of that without having to write any code, just this nice graphical experience, and I'm up and running in a couple of minutes. And when I think about those targets, it can also now send to Postgres. So the Azure Database Managed Postgres offering, be it single or flexible or hyperscale, which has the Citus extension, I can send to it. There's also been a performance boost for Stream Analytics. I think it's a 45% or up to which means if I have the same amount of workload, I can now provision less streaming units, which means I pay less money. So I can pay less money for the same performance. And finally, Azure Active Directory certificate-based authentication has a number of updates. Now I did a video on certificate-based authentication. This really is a powerful native capability that I don't have to now try and hook into sync on-premises. I can use those little keys, for example, but there were certain limitations to what I could do with it. Well, they've updated it, and for the latest version of, for example, Windows 11, the 22H2, I can actually authenticate at the logon screen. So I can now do certificate-based authentication directly at the logon screen if it's the brand new Windows 11 22H2 and you'll get all the SSO. A number of iOS and Android apps can also now use that certificate-based authentication, and they've improved some of the admin experience as well. So really just some nice improvements to more and more companies want to use certificate-based authentication. There are some obviously directives from governments to leverage that. Now I can do that directly with Azure AD. I don't have to try and hook into something else to achieve it. And that was it. As always, I appreciate watching. I hope that was useful. And until next video, take care.